Hello, Megalithomaniacs. Welcome back. We're here having an interview with author Andrew Collins and Debbie Cartwright and myself, Hugh Newman. Now, we're going to be looking at some new revelations and some new discoveries from the Tastepela culture of southeast Turkey, the area that incorporates Gebekli Tepe, Karahan Tepe, Seybirch, and several other sites in that vicinity. Now, all of these date back to at least 11,000 years, actually up to about 11,600 years. So we're looking at an extremely ancient culture that Andrew has been writing about and researching for decades. I've been involved for the last 10 years and have a book out on the subject. And Debbie has been assisting Andrew with his research for a very long time. And recently did a fantastic lecture at the Origins Conference about the animism of the ancients and the beliefs of the people who may have built Gebekli Tepe. So I want to welcome you both. Thanks for joining me. Um, thank you, Andrew. All right. Hey. And thank you, Debbie. Uh, yeah, we do appreciate you taking your time here. So we're going to start off um, having a look at a site that we all know about, that we've researched, we've all visited now as well, a site called Sabert. The reason we want to start here is because at the very end of September 2023, we had a chance to visit it and we saw some brand new discoveries exposed in the excavation there. Now, we know about the main panel, the narrative panel that's been discovered there and the beautiful rock cut architecture and the carvings. But there's much more coming out of the ground at this yeah. particular site. So this is a scan of the Sabirch panel, the potentially elliptical enclosure, although we've been discussing this as possible different geometries. And on the left there, we have the strange carving of like the sort of serpent head um, carved on the ground at Sabirch. And we have other angles on it here. You can kind of get a sense of what's going on uh, in this 3D way, which I think is quite compelling. But Sabirch is an absolutely fascinating site. It's thought to date back to at least 11,000 years ago. Uh, it's got 3D relief carvings of these leopards and this gentleman holding his part and another guy jumping up and down with a auroch or a bull. This is the strange carving once again that is actually on the sort of bedrock just outside the front. And there's a whole lot going on here, but this is what's been known about for a while, all these parts of the site, including this stone here, which JJ and I found to have uh, carvings on it on the side of it the arms and the hands and so forth but more recently in late september 2023 myself and andrew and our group including jj got a chance to actually visit the site but a whole other area was being excavated now we saw some of this when we went in may but you can see here that it's been filled in there's multiple t pillars and enclosures and everything else but as you keep walking further away from what the main area where the panel where the rock cut enclosure is uh, as the direction the people in the group here are walking in we came across this these two what look like two blocks coming out of the ground now this was in like mid-september last year and we were really intrigued by this we thought maybe this was a porthole stone maybe this was a doorway maybe it was an, um, a dromos stone like we see at gebekli tepe and then when we went there a couple of weeks later the, after the tour it had been exposed and there's me getting all excited pointing at it and you can see some really interesting stuff in this whole area here a close-up of it's got like a hole carved through it um we've got a nice sunset with with the image here. i mean this is pretty massive this is like what seven seven feet wide maybe something along those lines and there's the orientation as well and and me and andrew and you can jump in here andrew we were discussing this as a possible porthole stone or as a possible drone moss or just like a kind of um you know, kind of like a window that we find at these sites. But what's your take on it? Um, yeah, I mean, it's a Dromos stone. It's basically the entrance into a passageway that's going to be leading into the actual enclosure itself. I mean, there's a similar one that was found, as you said, at Gebekli Tepe in Enclosure C. But that one was not so elaborate as this. I mean, what's so important about this one is that it's beautifully cut and dressed. You know, in a style which you really wouldn't expect until many thousands of years later, in all honesty. And there's quite a few other areas at the site. We noticed this uh, near the entrance to the site when you walk into the new excavation. Notably, it seems to have one stone in the middle. 
And then we have Andrew standing above this one as well. And this is something that um, they found over and over again at the site. And this has just come out. It's just been released by the archaeologists like the last week or so. That they're claiming with Saybirch, and I want to get your both your feedback on this, is that these are small enclosures with one pillar in the middle. And they say that either side of these, there's domestic buildings all interlinked with these small enclosures and then some larger enclosures. Then obviously the main, what appears to be the main enclosure with the panel on it and things like this. So so we didn't realise at the time, but these are it's been said now by the archaeologists that these are small enclosures with seven or eight stones with one pillar in the middle and then next to these we have domestic and here's another image of uh one of the central stones with the cl classic v-neck um but yeah i don't know what i don't know what you make of that this has just come out i mean have you got any thoughts about this yeah well i mean firstly they don't know whether this is domestic or not i mean that's just purely a guess um i mean that's not to say that people weren't you know li living there or at least on a temporary basis but we were discussing this, uh, Deb, myself and, and our friends, uh, just a few weeks ago at Gebekli Tepe. And I think it would be better to see these uh, rooms more like hotel rooms as opposed to, you know, permanent dwellings. Uh, would you agree, Deb? Oh, yes. Um, I think, you know, some of the ritual aspects of, say, Birch would have been for particular events and particular festivals. So this is almost like, you know, uh, kind of glamping um, with kind of like portable uh, rich enclosures near to where people actually lived and stayed, but on temporary kind of basis uh, for certain times of the year. Yeah, I, I think I think I think I've got to agree with you. I think we actually wrote we, we kind of wrote the idea that these were like um, permanent sites, but not permanent settlements. They were kind of yeah. like uh, yeah, they feel more they feel more it. like. I mean, they're trying to make out, uh, it's the general kind of agenda now, to make out these are not temples. These are special buildings, they call them. Yeah. These are not sacred sites. These are not where people visited at certain times. Yeah, and it just doesn't quite add up. I mean, there's a lot of contradiction going on here, and I, I find it fascinating. I think the debate is going to go on about this until more excavation is done, because... You know, you're going to have, you know, places like Gebekli Tepe, you're probably going to have a few people who manage the site, you know, 12,000, yeah. 11,000 years ago. So there's going to be some people who have to stay there to keep an eye on it. Then the groups would come in for rituals, certain times a yeah. year, astronomical times, you know, get involved, do the building, brew loads of beer, things like this. Um, but, yeah, so there's a, there's a big debate about that. We can, we can get into that a bit later maybe. But I just want to show you a couple more things with – um Saybirch that we spotted while we were there and this is kind of exclusive some of this hasn't been published that we know of yet this is one of the strange stones uh, i thought was very very interesting uh with this very strange kind of cupules and shaping on it not dissimilar to the kind of uh serpent head which he carved on the bedrock outside the panel enclosure uh, but what's really interesting and this is now being put out there uh, by the archaeologists at the site is that human remains have been found at um, in one of the enclosures at Saybirch, possibly more. And if you look on the top right there, you can see yeah. them. I mean, we couldn't quite believe it when we kind of um, uh, spotted this. And then we've got them here as well. And they seem to be possibly disarticulated. There's like, you know, different parts. And there may be even some kind of covering or kind of... Um, you know linen or something on it as well we're not sure uh more research needs to be done but i know that very recently the archaeologists really wanted to kind of make make it out that this has actually been discovered this could be a big deal it could be dna tests done with it um and you know we find this in what appears to be one of the kind of more domestic type i'm not saying they are domestic but domestic yeah. type buildings then this isn't a, a place that appears to have lots of tea pillars and things like that but who knows there may be some found within it we just don't know so it's all a bit s speculative and a bit vague but the fact is some very important discoveries um are starting to be made at Saybirch, and no doubt when we go back there in may and in september we're going to see more as it unfolds um and so yes yeah, so, and also there's a report came out i read um the archaeologists at gobekli tepe that they found more human remains inside uh the kind of fill especially around uh, the main enclosures that have been excavated there as well and so more and more human remains do seem to be uh, coming out of the ground here 
don't yeah. know what your thoughts are on this. Yeah. Well, I mean, the important thing here is the DNA, isn't it? I mean, you know, what's this going to tell us about the origins of Tash Tepala? I mean, we've speculated that there may well be a connection with peoples coming down from the Caucasus beyond that on the Russian steppe and obviously as far east eventually as the Ural Mountains and Siberia, Mongolia. So, you know, that's a prediction. But in addition to that, you've got indigenous peoples who would have been here for many thousands of years. You'd have had incoming peoples probably from the Levant, um, you know, connected with the Natufians there. And something that, you know, m myself, Debbie, and I know that you and JJ have been working on, the idea that there's an influence also coming in from, from the Marmara region of Western Turkey as well. Yes, that's right, yeah. Yeah, from northern, north, northwestern yeah. Turkey. But yeah. the thing is about this is that the DNA could show anything because, you know, it might be likely that such a vast area of hunter-gatherer culture would be seen as like the centre of the world. I mean, it could have attracted uh, populations from all over, all over to come. So you're not necessarily going to have DNA or, uh, you know, a hominid that would be a builder or somebody who started this culture or somebody who's consumed this culture. It could be a visitor from literally north, south, east, west, you know, to that to that centre. Um, so it's it's not it's not just going to be clear cut that it's the DNA of a builder. So yes, yeah, so Say Birch, I think, is just one of the most important sites coming out of that whole area. I mean, I'm fascinated uh, by the name of it as well, which uh, we kind of discovered when we were on our tour. Actually, we we're kind of doing so much trying to work out the name, but and it kind of means, you know, sign of the zodiac. Say does, and Birch means. Um, counting whereas Birk b-i-r-c in kurdish means watchtower and there's actually supposed to be a watchtower at the site as well and it got knocked down like less than 100 years ago or so and so that's really i find that little thick little clues like that we find in the place names that i find really intriguing uh no doubt more will be discovered i'm sure you know even ian lahoyak linked with possible giants eating or swallowing or something like this and so we have a whole um you know, possibility of trying to understand these place names may have been memories of what went on there. But we're going to move on from Say Birch. There's much more to discuss. Um, obviously, we're going to be looking at Karahan Tepe. We're going to now look at the new discoveries that are now actually on display at the newly opened uh, Archaeology Museum in Shanlurfa. Now, they've actually bought um, some of the statues and discoveries from the sites and put them in the museums. And not all of them, some of them are going to be staying at the sites themselves. Obviously, when we go back in May and September on our tours, we're going to look at all of this. So, you know, don't fret if you feel like you're going to miss anything. We're going to cover as much as we can today. But then if you want to see them for yourself, obviously you can join us. And Andrew's going to be covering that in depth um, in part in his new book about Karahan Tepe. I've covered some of it in uh, my small wooden book on the sites as well and uh, I think a lot more is going to be revealed today and in the future now the reason I say today is because Debbie and Andrew have just got back from a research trip to southeast Turkey it's the first time Debbie's been out there and she has got some remarkable um, stuff to explore and to share with us today which I'm quite looking forward to Andrew as well he got a chance to relook at some sites and some discoveries in much more detail and got to go to the museum and see these new artifacts close up so so can you share your screen can you show some graphics and let us know what happened um, over the last few weeks when you were out in southeast Turkey well, the last time we were at um, Karahain Tepe with myself, um, JJ, uh, Hugh, um, they had only just uncovered the new enclosure on the top of the hill. Um, we were able to see it, but we were told that we couldn't take any photographs, you know, literally at, at gunpoint. Um, and we realised that something big was going on. We found out that some statues had been found there and when we got back about a week or so afterwards this story came out in the turkish um you know news in the the Huriat, and it obviously revealed the um the discovery of this incredible 
um, you know, statue that is what about seven and a half feet tall um, and in a sitting position, um, holding his heart um, in this enclosure, which had been exposed, which is absolutely huge. And we'll come on to what we've discovered about that. And next to it, in a little altar area between two remaining T pillars that were on the northern edge of the enclosure was this incredible um, little uh, almost caricature um, vulture that you can see here on the right side of the, the picture. And I mean, all of this was happening, you know, as I say, immediately after we came back and we must have been there just a, a week or a couple of weeks after all of this was discovered. And so obviously we were able to, you know, get excited about this. Um, I've written about it. It's going in the new book, um, you know, Karahan Tepe. And so, you know, obviously when we went back uh, just a few weeks ago now, just over two weeks, we were eager to find out what new had been discovered at, um, at Karahan. Well, um, before we obviously get into that, I mean, one of the things that we were looking at is what did this huge statue actually represent? And the fact it was so large, you know, quite literally a giant, like the giant head down in the lower level of the enclosures at Karahan. I, you know, I began to suggest, and this is something that I will go into in great detail in the book, that this could actually be a representation um, of a an anarchy, you know, or some kind of, hybrid descendant of the Denisovans, you know, the Denisovan modern human hybrid. Um, and, you know, the, the size of the statue makes absolute sense. And anyway, so we went back there and we were able to see it, um, but not photograph it. This is a picture that's come from somebody else, uh, I think possibly even in Russia, um, who were able to take this photograph. And this shows basically one of the trenches that they'd opened up. They've opened up another trench um, to the east of that, which is behind what you can see here now. But when we got there, what we discovered is that this is now an absolutely huge enclosure. It's, they believe, 33 metres in diameter, which is about 108 feet uh, across. And that's going to make it the largest enclosure ever discovered at a Tash Tapala site. Um, so they're obviously in opening um, new trenches uh, to the south of this one, um, which they will obviously be looking at probably in about May this year when the excavations restart again. But the other interesting point is that the date of this enclosure has actually gone down. Um, they were they originally suggesting it could be 9,000 to 9,400 BC, but they're now saying that it's actually much younger, uh, probably about 9,000 to 8,600 BC, sometime probably towards the lower end of that range. And that is really, really crucial for the astronomical alignments that we've already worked out to do with this. Um, because, I mean, what we'd already worked out when Hugh and I first saw the site is that it was lined up with a hill ridge towards the north northeast, And there were some low farm buildings there. And it was very obvious that it was targeting that hilltop. So that made it actually quite easy to try and understand what its alignment may be. Well, what I found is that that um, hill ridge, that farm is called Silan Tepe, which basically means the crest or ridge of the gazelle, because the gazelle was an animal that was indigenous to that area. And also various representations of gazelles have actually been found at Karahan Tepe. I don't think there's any direct link. But what this uh, allowed us to do was to look at Stellarium, you know, the free a sky program that allows you to look at the sky from any period in history. And the exact alignment of that enclosure was towards the rising of the Cygnus star Deneb. 
And although it worked for 9000 BC, it was better if the enclosure was slightly younger, maybe something like 8800 BC. And now we know that that's absolutely precisely when the structure was actually created. So that makes this alignment even more accurate. And what's important is that it's not just uh, Deneb in Cygnus that it was targeting, but also the northern opening of the Milky Way's dark rift, which at the time would have been seen stretched right away across the sky towards the east and directly in line with the stars of Scorpius and the Galactic Bulge, which is the centre of our own Milky Way galaxy, the big enclosure on the lower level would have exactly targeted that. And that means that these enclosures were looking very specifically at the northern opening and the southern termination of the Milky Way's dark rift. And that cannot be coincidence, in my opinion. Um, so let's go back on the next one. Yeah, so there you go. That's what you would have seen looking eastwards around 8,800 BC to about 9,000 BC. You'd have seen the galactic bulge. You'd have seen the stars of Scorpius. And Scorpius, even though we know it today as a scorpion, um, in the past it was also a snake in various cultures around the world. And we'll come on, obviously, to the importance of the snake at Karahan Tepe. And we've got some incredible news about that as well. Um, this is the lower level enclosure, uh, the Great Ellipse, as we call it, structure AD. And those people that would have been sitting on the benches between the huge buttresses, which double up as T pillars, would have been able to look directly out at the galactic bulge, the stars of Scorpius, you know, and the time frame of the construction, not only of this particular enclosure, but obviously the one on the top of the hill. Now, we mentioned earlier the um, the character caricature um, vulture that was found in the actual new enclosure on the hill, and this is it. It's now on display in the San Nerfa Archaeological Museum, and very cute it is indeed. In fact, we wish to try and make plushies out of this because, I mean, it's just crying out. It's like some kind of disney vulture basically i mean it's just beautiful um the height of it is probably about uh, 22 inches and it was exactly in line with the actual orientation of the enclosure but facing inwards actually into the interior of the structure almost as if we're talking about the particular influence that's represented by the vulture coming from that direction and, of course, what we know is that Cygnus was seen um, in ancient times as a vulture in various different cultures of the region, most obviously in Armenian star law, where even to this day it's known as Anjik, which means the, the vulture. Um, and, of course, obviously Armenia um, and the Armenian peoples stretched right the way through into eastern and southeastern um, Anatolia in the past. You know, so it's quite clear that the different cultures would have had their own star log, which would have intermingled and become one. And I think that that's really important. So I'm pretty certain that that nice, cute vulture does actually represent Cygnus, just as it does, of course, on the famous Pillar 43, the vulture stone, at Gebekli Tepe, that's something that myself um, and engineer Rodney Hale have been saying for, for many years. And I think the more discoveries that are made at um, you know these Tash Tepela sites, the more this is being proved correct. I mean, you know, the, the vulture is a psychopomp. You know, it is that creature that helps the soul go from this world to the next. And the entrance into the sky world what in Native American tradition would be known as an OG, you know, quite literally a hole in the sky, was being guarded by these uh, Cygnus, um, you know, in its form as the sky figure, which you can see 
on 43. But, but well, before I go on to that, Debbie, do you want to say anything about the vulture and um, being the psychopomp? Well, I'd just say that, you know, the discovery of the of the Disney vulture and the um, the tall figure next to the vulture quite clearly indicates that it is a vulture shaman or a shaman concerned with uh, the psychopomp of the vulture and um, the death journey of the soul. So it is, I would just say it's nice for you and, and therefore me to be vindicated finally that, yeah, uh, a vulture shamanism um, and the symbolic death journey is, is something that you talked about in the Ashes of Angels. And, and finally, it's all being vindicated by actual archaeological discoveries. So, so, so that's good to see. And yep. it will continue. Yeah. And I mean, yeah, we've been on to vulture shamans um, since you know, writing from the ashes of angels, which, um, you know, Debbie was certainly one of the big inspirations for a lot of the material in there. Um, and that was 1996. That was before any Taj Tepela site had been really made public. Um, I mean, uh, Navali Chori had been discovered at that time, but I'll be honest, you know, so little had been written about it up to that time that I wasn't even aware of it. Um, and the first spades were going into the ground, when I was writing from the Ashes of Angels, that was in the autumn or fall in 1995. And of course, you know, we were talking about this elite, this shamanic elite, which we believed had kickstarted civilization in this area shortly after the end of the last ice age. And we said that they were vulture shamans and that, you know, they saw the vulture as a psychopomp, you know, as a quite literally taking the souls from this world to the next. And, you know, the more we find out, the more this seems to be valid. But anyway, let's go from uh, vultures to another animal together, because this is the uh, a picture of one of the latest discoveries at um, Parahantapai. And it's just to the east of the main big enclosure, which I think is there. And they're calling this the kitchen. And I mean, it's got two pillars in it and that, but they think this is the archaeologists that it's domestic and that they found animal bones, you know, in their multitude here. And they think that this is where the meals were prepared for people before they embarked upon any special actions inside the special building next to them. Um, now, I mean, immediately we heard this, um, and as Debbie will tell you in a minute, she said, uh, I don't think so. Yeah, this has an incredible magical function. Now, what was your first thought, Deb, when you saw this? Um, first first off, I thought that this was uh, um, kind of like, uh, yes, I agree, it's a preparation point, and there would have been domestic uh, remains there. Um, bones, animal bones, plants, etc. But I think it was a place for the creation of medicines, uh, animal remedies, herbal remedies, you know. Um, and I think, did you mention, Andrew, that the bones that were found were snake bones? Well, come on to that. Yeah, predominantly amount of snake bones. And, you know, I don't think they lived particularly exclusively off a diet of snake. So these weren't being prepared for food. So you could see it like, you know, you have that um, archetypal term where they say, oh, he's a snake salesman, he's, he's selling all these kind of potions or whatever. But this was a kind of like prehistoric meth lab, I suppose, where they were cooking up, uh, could be hallucinogenic substances, um, remedies, healings, medicine, things like that. So, yes, it was a kitchen, but I don't think purely domestic. No, I agree. And the important thing about it, as Debbie just alluded to there, is that they have found a profusion of bones belonging to a particular species of snake. And that's the Anatonian meadow viper. And this is incredibly important discovery um, because as you'll read in the Karahan Tepe book is that there is snake imagery all over the place at Karahantapai. It's in carved relief. It's um, it's incised on walls. Um, it's been found on bowls. Um, and everything, you know, that seems to in some way be 
abstractly associated with with the snake. And I mean, this is the image that um, Russell Hussein has done uh, for you know the new book, um, showing vulture shaman, not vulture shaman, snake shamans actually at work within the Great Ellipse structure AD. You know, just perhaps what was actually going on there, and that we think that it formed part of oracular com communications, um, almost certainly with some kind of cosmic snake one that would have been associated with the milky way with its head as the galactic bulge which not only looks like a snake head but would have been an incredibly bright sight in the skies eleven thousand years ago and many ancient cultures around the world have seen the milky way as a snake and we think that this was a place of oracular communication very much like the oracle of the Pythia um, at Delphi in Greece during much later times, which was all connected with the cult of Apollo, but also involved the um, the slaying of this, this serpent called the Python. And the fumes of the Python that were under the ground would come up and intoxicate the priestesses, the Pythonesses, then make them you know, give these oracular communications. And I think that something similar was going on at Karahan Tepe. But what we had worked out, what I'd worked out, and this was after we came back from Turkey last year from one of our tours, was that there was a possibility that the pillar shrine, structure AB, was actually a representation of the interior of the head of a snake. Uh, with the lines running uh, out from it towards the right, as you look at here, as the neck um, or the body of the snake itself. And the snake that I actually overlaid on the pillar shrine was the Anatolian Meadow Viper. And at that time, I had absolutely no confirmation at all that the Tash Tepler people knew of that snake i mean it's indigenous even to this day in the tech tech mountains and i used it simply because i knew that it was a poisonous snake but now we have absolute confirmation that it was actually used in these enclosures at quebecly tepe so that to me is quite incredible and i that strengthens the idea in my opinion that the pillar shrine is the head of a snake but what's also interesting is that in the enclosure next to it, um, there is an incised snake on the wall. Now, it's not easy to see. I've ringed it here. Um, and here it is again. And on the towards the right, you can see how the head goes up in the air. If you can see the cursor going on there, you can see the shape of the head. But what's interesting, that's it. I mean, I, I brought it out and lined the head. And what I felt was there was a possibility that this other enclosure, which we call the pitch shrine, which is structure AA, may also be the head of a snake. So I overlaid that outline on the um, the, the pitch shrine, and it too was it was perfect to the actual incised snake that's actually on the wall inside it. So once again. I think we're looking here at a very deliberate act to create this enclosure in the shape of a snake's head. Now, we'll come on to why they might have been doing this in a moment, and I'll bring in Debbie if we can. But basically, you know, the idea that you can quite literally carve the rock to create snake's head has got to be something important. But and I'm going to put this question to Debbie. I mean, I know what the answer is going to be, but I'd like to hear what she says. Why go into the mouth of a snake? Um, okay, that's not a simple answer. Um, but in many animistic traditions, um, the snake is uh, not just seen as a, like a dangerous animal or whatever. It's, as you said, it's a reference to this cosmic serpent, this um sort of symbolic snake that represents if you like a form of primal chaos so it is something that existed in the cosmos before physical matter was born 
Um, so the cosmic snake represents this sort of uh, pre-existent sort of chaotic state. So to go into the mouth of the serpent is to, to go closer to that pre-physical state, that metaphysical state, the state before creation itself, before order, where there was just this primal kind of chaos. So you're going into the cosmic ocean by stepping into the mouth of the serpent and so that you are able to journey either shamanically or in trance to uh, commune with that uh, primal and cosmic ocean. So that, that's yep. a very short summary of it. Yeah. So, so in other words, whereas we've obviously been talking about the vulture acting as a psychopomp yeah. and accompanying the soul from this world to the next and back again, this is a more primal form of that same process. Not quite. I mean, you wouldn't say that the serpent was a psychopomp. The serpent is what's there on the other side. Uh, the vulture and both the leopard as well and other animals are psychopomps um, that help uh, a shamanic trance or, or spirit journey or even death journey um, towards um, the life that's after physical matter, the metaphysical. The snake is what's there after. It represents that primal chaos, that cosmic ocean. Um, the origins of where we come from before before life was physical. So it's not a psychopomp, it's it's what's after, if that makes sense. Right, okay. Now, here's okay. something which people have thrown around up to now. I mean, obviously, Q, you'll come in with this as well, but there's been talk for a long time that water may have been placed inside these enclosures now, it's possible because they're obviously carved out of the bedrock, so there's no reason why water, if poured into them in some way, will not remain there until it dries up. Um, and we had a geologist with us um, back in September who was able to note marks and stains on the walls of the pillar shrine and also the pit shrine next to it and say that they were caused by water exposure. And he also suggested that water had been used inside these structures. And this was something that you picked up on immediately, Debbie, when you got there. What did you feel? Oh, yeah. I um, mean, I walked up and um, I think viewing the pit shrine and the pillar shrine, realising how close they are together and obviously understanding that they're already understanding that they're in the shape of the snake and that it was connected to the cosmic state, I said, oh, my God, this place was a veritable spa. You know, this was like a spa, kind of like a, a mystical and an esoteric spa. So if there was water in the bottom of the pillar shrine, not only does it reflect the pillars, you don't need a lot of water to have a, a full reflection of something. Um, it, it signifies that cosmic ocean, these sort of you know, it wasn't just, oh, we like water. Why did they like water? Why did they want water? Because it reflected the cosmic ocean, this idea of the celestial waters, um, the sky sea. There's lots of words for it in animistic cultures and in Vedic culture as well. Um, Sumerians and the Egyptians, they all had this idea of this cosmic ocean. So to put water in these shrines is firstly to like reflect the cosmos, especially at night, you know, this idea of the night waters, it reflects the cosmos, but also it captures, or they may believe that it captured um, the power of the cosmos. So part of the essence of this cosmic ocean or these celestial river, the celestial waters of the night waters is also what it's called. To. And in the pit shrine here, um, this probably would have been more full of water and in other animistic cultures, water like that is used as a representation of diving or going into or back into the womb, back into the cosmic waters, the membrane between order and chaos, life and death, heaven and earth. Um, and they're used for initiatory purposes. You go into the waters for um, trance journeys, initiatory purposes, prophecy, um, all kinds of reasons that you need to journey into that cosmic ocean. So this was with a whole veritable spa of uh, you know, water features, basically, because uh, another thing about water in animistic cultures is that they uh, water and chaos are inseparable. 
um, you know, the cosmic ocean is chaos and chaos is, you know, they see water as dangerous, as unpredictable, uncontrollable. So chaos and water are inseparable. Um, so definitely you see this, if it, if these shrines were filled with water and they did use water both as a reflection, as an accumulation and a representation of this cosmic, of the cosmic realms, these celestial waters, um, then, you know, you have to ask a, a, a real cosmogony is starting to emerge about Tash Tepler, about what their real cosmogony was about. And although I think survival and fertility, all of these things played a massive role, this is another perhaps more important or just as important part of that puzzle about what their cosmogony was about. And it was about um, returning to this cosmic ocean before the creation of physical matter, before order. Um, so chaos isn't viewed as a, a negative thing. It's viewed in quite a positive way now in animistic and tribal beliefs. Um, it's viewed as this undifferentiated, unsplit, undualistic, unified whole before we were, were split into this ordered dualistic world. Um, and I think if water is at Karahantepe and they use water in this way, um, it's going to help us understand their cosmogony a lot more. So. So, uh, Hugh, just going back to the water, what what have you heard from, what's people said to you about the ideas of water being in these particular structures? Yeah, I mean, it, it seemed quite obvious when we, when we first saw it, didn't it, that it just, the, the channels carved out everywhere, it, it could collect water. Obviously, there's no springs directly close by, but they have kind of um, the underground bell-shaped chambers, especially on Ketchley Hill, where... Uh, they collect it. But I mean, one of the things that JJ and our friend Charles Koss, that it was, it, it reminded us of um, like the Vedic symbolism of um, the Shiva Lingam, really. And, uh, and it's always, always has a pool, always has water associated with it as well and channels for it to go out from and come in from. And it, and all the, the, the what Debbie's talking about, it all fits in with this kind of higher kind of, uh, uh, cosmological beliefs and it's not just yes, about fertility yes. and symbols of fertility okay. there's, other, there's other sides to it and so I think there's a, a lot to be said for that and, it, and and the Vedic thing really gets me having been to India recently and, and researching it I, I met up with Praveen Mohan we had a long discussion about it and he was he couldn't quite believe what the pillar shrine at Karahan Tepe he was like whoa this is like you know potentially very very important um uh, when it comes to even Vedic ideas, because so much, you know, look at the Navali Chori head with the serpent on the back of it. It's got the same, is it the Anatolian viper on the back? I'm not okay. sure. Yeah. I, I mean, that, that's a very Vedic kind of priest ponytail, like, uh, yeah. you know what I mean? So, so all these kind of things all fit together. I mean, the only, yes, the idea of the, I mean, they must have collected rainwater, clearly, that is, is evidence now they harvest rainwater at Quebecly Tepe. Um, because Quebec Tepe and Karen there's no natural water there that that are known that is known about. Whereas Navali Chori, uh Yan La um, and so and many of the other sites have water sources nearby, Cheono and others. Whereas these don't. These are like away from that. These are like special places you go to to do things and they might go there at certain times of year when it, it's rainy season, so there's gonna be water, then they do the ceremonies at you know later on in the, who knows you know and so yeah so i think it's all, all all valid i think water played a part there's too many channels even the cut marks in tradition if you look at jj's research in maria gimbutas they were to collect rainwater and also to collect dew overnight so you have this pure water used for healing and ceremonies and other such things cool okay well i mean this just out of interest is a, a sort of schematic view of the heavens um from different ancient beliefs and, and practices. And you can obviously see the earth being like the, the middle world. You've got the underworld, also known as the lower world. Um, beneath that, obviously, you've got other aspects. You've got the primeval ocean that would surround the physical earth itself. And the ancients believed this, ocean, yeah. this extended into the air, extended even beyond the stars itself. In other words, the stars of the canopy of stars of heaven and the earth were part of the same thing and that they were inside something much more primeval or primordial or as debbie said chaotic that existed before that and it was about trying to connect with what was there before creation to get 
absolute answers of you know of existence presumably yeah but you're right there andrew because um i think that you know the you can see on i think on pillar 43 those three handbags which are not handbags by the way um represent these three realms the earth the underworld and the sky world um they're the three cosmic houses the three kind of um areas of of life and death you know whatever so there's the, the primal ocean binds them all those three things together that trinity and i think you can see water on pillar 43 above and below those three handbags you can. And, and i'm beginning to realize that this cosmogony of the cosmic ocean that you see in the vedic philosophy sumerian egyptian and levi yarasan Yazidi, they all have this idea is possibly has its origins here if we're going to speculate about a cosmogony and uh, yeah. i think pillar 43 gives us more clues to this as well and, and talking of pillar 43 and the handbags i mean notice how the ocean of heaven here is actually the shape of a handle of a handbag i mean that's mm -hmm. yeah i mean ultimately <laughs> that's that's the handle of the handbags on um pillar 43 that's what they are that's actually what they represent that is the true handbag of a man bag so to speak um yeah you know There's because what they're really them. showing are aspects of heaven three different parts of heaven the sumerians the babylonians divided the heavens into three parts and that's exactly what you see on pillar 43 mm -hmm. yes. so okay Another let's move on so moving on, yeah. Well, moving on, right? Okay, this is obviously Gebekli Tepe as it's seen today, um, and quite clearly we went there, and that brings us neatly into the incredible Bor statue, which was discovered um, here. It was r discovered right there, and I'm going to show you a picture of where, which is right at the rear part where the altar area is, if you like, and the porthole stone of um, structure, or sorry, enclosure D. And this is exactly where it was found. Um, and it's got paint on it, literally 11,000 year old paint. Um, and I mean, it's an incredible statue. And as I said, it's it's there on display now in the Chandler for archaeological museum where we obviously saw it a couple of weeks ago and something that we realized almost immediately looking at it changes the perspective of what this actually represents and i'm going to show you this now look what's in its claws is it do you call do boars have claws is that the right thing yes oops Hoops. Hoops. Oh, hoops. that's the correct word yeah <laughs> okay that's that's why i put held in its grip because i couldn't remember what the exact term was it's clearly a human skull and that changes everything as far as what it might actually represent um and you've noticed this deb now what do mm -hmm. you think that this represents based okay. on the observation so i tend to go from everything i I try and view in the, I view from an animistic perspective what is the animistic perspective or shamanic perspective here and, and that's what I go through so like Karen Hentepi the first thing that hit me was this was a veritable spa when I looked at the boar the immediate impression was it's got a skull in its head this is the skull smasher of Native American tradition um, the thing that actually is the mediator between physical life and spiritual life the, the the vulture is the psychopomp which captures the soul as the head and takes it through the soul hole to the milk through the milky way and above and beyond into the cosmic ocean but the boar is the creature that is physically present on the cosmic mound of creation uh the, the first earth mound of creation and it is responsible for the extinguishing of physical life um and i think there were, uh, I think it's true that boars can crush a skull in their jaws. So uh, although lions and tigers pierce a skull with their canids, uh, I think a boar can crush a skull with its jaws. So, and, so yes, it is skull crusher. And you can yeah. see, I think the, the red pigment in its mouth may have indicated blood. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. And I mean, this term, 
you know, skull crusher or skull smasher or whatever. This is a term that's used by many Native American um, First Nations um, to describe the sky figure that's actually associated with um, the area of Deneb and Cygnus constellation, which is like the judge of the dead as they enter into the afterlife. Now, I'm not necessarily saying that this boar has got anything directly to do with Cygnus, but the idea of the skull smasher or the skull crusher is to release the soul from a person's head. These people in Neolithic times and in nat amongst Native Americans, they saw the human soul as embedded within the skull or the head of an individual, and it had to be released at some point. And this is what this creature would do. It releases the skull, sorry, the soul or the spirit to enter into the afterlife. Uh, and that's the reason why it's positioned there, because directly above it is the point of exit from the physical world into the afterlife, literally. I mean, you know, obviously they're not necessarily looking at this as a journey of hours or days or whatever, but uh, as a, a liminal journey. In other words, coming out of the mundane and going into the liminal and that's the reason why it's placed directly beneath the porthole zone itself. Um, so I think that that's important. But you, you, but you're also are connecting it with Vedic tradition. Uh, and, Rick, and Hugh, I think you'll be interested in this as well because we've been talking about Vedic yeah. stuff. Yeah, I mean, we were talking earlier about the cosmogony of the idea of like chaos as a cosmic ocean, celestial waters, blah blah blah. Um, and that a lot of ancient traditions had this cosmogony and this origin story. And when in Vedic tradition, there's various uh, variations of the of the primeval mound emerging out of, of order, emerging out of the cosmic ocean of chaos. Egypt has one and Samaria has one. But in the Vedic tradition, the first creature that's placed upon the primal mound, um, it takes the form of a boar um, in Vedic tradition. So, you know, in that way, sort of like the, the, the god, I can't remember the name of the god, but the, all gods um, exist in this cosmic ocean. So if there's a, a belief or nature and tradition that believes in this cosmic ocean, they all agree that the gods existed in this cosmic ocean, this this sort of space water, if you know what it means, these celestial waters, and they existed in a unified state, either god or goddess or male or female, or good or evil or whatever. Um but there was a particular god of these waters or, or deity of these waters that created uh, the boar to go upon the first primal man of creation. In Veda tradition, it's a boar. So I think that that's interesting, considering that we're making so many connections between what the Tash Tepler may have been up to and the Veda tradition. Um, so, yeah. But the interesting, I mean, obviously this boar-headed um, yeah. you know, divinity is... In the cosmic ocean, you can see him surrounded by snakes yeah. um, and other, you know, items of, of darkness, I suppose, and chaos. Yeah. Um, and basically, it's he that, you know, rises out of the waters and, you know, with him comes the, the first land. So, you know, th th there's a lot here. And obviously, this is just the beginning of the understanding with that. Now, OK, now we're going to come on. Can I, can I just jump in? Can I just jump in? Yeah. Uh, I'll edit my jumping in bit. Yeah, yeah, go on. Uh, but interestingly, I, I had no idea that the the main boar statue was holding a skull or something in its hands like that, or oh, its, its paws or its uh, hooves. That is, why, why wasn't that mentioned before? Why didn't they tell it? Why wasn't this mentioned in the public kind of um when it came out because there's there's also like uh they found obviously they found loads of book quite a few boar statues at Quebec the tepe and enclosure c they found one at the bottom right next to the t pillars that also had red ochre on it and that had one of the stone plates next to it as well mm -hmm. and also there's uh as you know, there's, they're calling it a goddess statue was found at Quebec Tepe, which you know all about, holding a skull or holding a ball as well. So, so there's, there's been indications of leading up to this, but now this the placement of this one. And, and the thing that blows me, away, that was just sitting there underneath a load of rubble that they could have cleared away at any time. 
And they yeah. only decided to do it in September 2023. And it's like, it's just, in, I mean, did they not realize, did they scan it and realize something was there or it was just a chance to discover? I mean, yeah, I mean, this is this is pretty compelling. I mean, it, the fact we're finding more Vedic things as well is is absolutely mind-blowing. Okay, well, yeah. we're going to come on to so one. Which... I just want to end with what Hugh said about the goddess, actually, because that is important because the cosmic ocean, it's also representative of the waters of the womb. So it's not a traditional fertility idea of just giving birth, but that the waters of the womb are reflecting directly of this cosmic ocean in, in the sky, you know, in, you know out uh, in sky world. So it, it's instead of sort of being fertility, the waters of the womb are quite important at that. And, and sort of an older woman um, is obviously seen as a gateway into those primordial waters as well. So there is a sort of, I'd say goddess element in it in the, in that way, yeah. Okay, but well, we're now going to come on to one which is we think probably will blow your mind. Um, but and this is going to be a lot from Debbie here. But the first thing that we saw when we went into the Chandler for Archaeological Museum, other than the Paleolithic section, which is to be honest not all that, is of course you are confronted by this. And that obviously is Urfa Man. Um, and Urfa Man was discovered, I think it was in around 1990, wasn't it, Hugh? About 1990? Well, yeah. we'll say about that time. Yeah, 1993. 93. Was it 93? Anyway, yeah. just to the north of the Poles of Abraham, um, just where it begins to rise up um, in an area called um, Hizel Coram, I think. Um, where there's a whole load of caves cut out of the rock. There is the, um, the hotel there, which is the El Ruha, um, and there's a police station and whatever. And there's a little road that runs on the right-hand side of the Ruha, and they were widening the road there, and they uncovered uh, for man. And, I mean, there is no question that it formed part of a Taj Tepala site because excavations were done under the uh, leadership of Bahatin Shelek um, and they found terrazzo floors, they found tea pillars, they found loads of other artifacts, loads of stone tools. All that's gone, I'm afraid, now. But the question is, who or what ultimately is Earth a man? What the hell was it doing there? And what is its relationship with the citadel itself, the actual hill? on which the castle of Urfa, or Edessa, as it was a couple of thousand years ago, was placed. What's the relationship with all of this? Well, this is what we're about to say is going to throw a curveball, I'm afraid. So um, so we were there in front of it, and Debbie noticed something. Now, do you want to introduce yeah. this? Um, yes. Um, there we go. There he is, Evma. And, and out of all of the trip... Um, that we visited all these sites, um, Urfa Man had the biggest impact on me. Um, and the I think it, it's all the things that we've talked about, um, about Karen Debbie, the water, the night waters, the shrines, being filled with water, the cosmic ocean, the, all the traditions that talk about chaos and the cosmic ocean, all has come from looking at Urfa Man because... The thing I noticed immediately is that it isn't necessarily Urfa man, but Urfa they. Um, if you look closely, um, it looks like it has two sets of genitals. So we're possibly looking at um, an intersex being, a hermaph the old fashioned word I think is hermaphrodite. Um, and it also looks like the penis is a, and the testicle are above it. There's this carved opening there below it in a circular shape. And it also looks like the penis is just being pulled aside to display it. Almost a display, kind of like more vagina-like opening. Um, and the hands are not on the penis, they're on the abdomen, which we see a lot in the Tashtepra culture, which is another uh, Vedic tradition of kundalini pooling or ki pooling in the abdomen. So it's a symbol of power to have your hands on your abdomen. Um but then you say you have the penis below that, but then this other carved opening. And the other interesting thing is that, that there's no other red pigment on the statue apart from in this 
carved open. There's the evidence of like on the boar's mouth. There is some red pigmentation here. So I think it's it's something that um, we should be considered that it is an intersex being. And also from behind, we had a look at some of the pictures of it from behind. You can see a close up there. Um, it has a real curvature of the hips here. So it, it's if you just saw that figure from the back, you would say it's a feminine figure. Um, you wouldn't necessarily say it was male. So, um, and I think, you know, the idea of an intersex or the old fashioned word, the hermaphroditic being is, is quite prevalent in esoteric and mystic traditions. Um, so if it is intersex, then we've got to look well, why would they do that? Why would they depict a statue with both sets of genitals? What's the importance there? Why would they do that? Why is it important? Um, and looking into it, you know, in animistic tradition, and again, Hugh, in Vedic tradition, uh, an intersex human or a hermaphrodite, to use the old fashioned term, is seen as a symbol of, guess what, primal chaos. So it's they're seen as something uh, concerning uh, in a positive way, uh, the unified state. So in chaos, you know, order, we have dualism. You know, everything's ordered. We have male and a female. We have an order of social standing. Everything's ordered in physical life. But before that, in the primal waters of, of the cosmic ocean, in this chaos, everything was unified. So a statue like the Earth, a statue, I have to say, we won't say mad necessarily now in the Earth, a statue, you're looking at something, uh, a reverence for an undifferentiated state prior to physical life or existence. So you're looking at a being that has come out of this cosmic ocean uh, of chaos. So you're looking at Tash Tepler more, their cosmology about much more focused on being chaos theorists, I suppose. Um, and so it's not so, so necessarily a sexual thing. It, in, I think in the media tradition, um, to have um, both sets of genitals was, and to be undifferentiated was regarded as being um, kind of like integrated. It's this whole union idea of being integrated with the self. So male and the female is integrated. It's the same as the self and Godhead. So you become like this kind of uh, super being, a kind of not human, but not quite God, like a demigod. And it's sort of, a, in Vedic tradition, it's a coveted state. It's a revered state to be in um, as a kind of demigod. So I think... This is what this statue represents, this sort of coveted state of being this mediator between the, the chaos and order and an undifferentiated whole, a unity that I think, you know, the death journey itself of the Tash Tepler shamans, this vulture death journey is sort of striving towards, they're striving towards that unity again, that unity of wholeness and being undifferentiated. Um, I think it's a kind of very undualistic view it's anti-dualism it's kind of an antinomian view um you know no order no rules no regulation but in that there's wholeness and uh unity so it does give us a clue to more about their cosmogony um and, and and more will come out of that but i think that the revelation that this could be an intersex and a hermaphroditic being and for a reason is is something that we're going to be continuing to look at this stage i've got just adding to that there's um yeah. the uh jim vieira is going to love this he, he's, he's he's obsessed by androgynous beings and like uh, like, like you say that uh, i've got female and male parts in, in the same being it's like and he's been doing a lot of research now. I don't think he spotted this at all. I don't think anyone spotted this, actually. I think you're the, probably the first, especially on the black and white photo. It's really clear. You can really see the clarity of it, of the female and the male parts there. It's not like it's... Uh, and also, there's no, there's no like, breasts on it as well. This is, And this is what something that JJ has been talking about to me recently, is that the, the, the central T-pillars at the main enclosures could also be like this because they're, they're, they're like sexless. They could, they could be male or female. They, they, they make exactly it kind of, right. they make it kind yeah. of vague. There's, there's a vagueness to it. And this fits in with some of her ideas about the twin gods and everything else that she's going to expand on uh, megalithomania and uh, in some videos and writings and stuff like this. And so, yeah, number one, Jim's going to love this. Number two, it backs up some of what JJ has been doing. 
and and it just brings a whole other dimension to this and even more vedic connection this is just pretty incredible yeah yeah i mean j just a couple of points here i mean firstly i mean i did look online to see if anybody had mentioned this at all and they hadn't the only the one person in a blog had noticed the hole and they 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 basically described it as a front ass basically in other words <laughs> that um yeah that it was an ass that was placed at the front um i mean i think they were almost joking but i mean so the idea that this is a a hole into the body certainly has been noticed before but nobody's realized what exactly is going on here um but what i do find interesting this was something i was um looking at as i was putting together this little slideshow earlier but i didn't really get a chance to put any slides in is that in dogon tradition amongst the, the peoples of mali um their deities called the nomo were also androgynous or intersexual or hermaphrodite um and you'll see a lot of statues online of these nomos who clearly have both male and female attributes at the same time um, so this is something that's probably quite widespread. Um, and if we can just go on to the idea of what a hermaphrodite is, is that the term, well, yeah, the term hermaphrodite comes from the offspring of Hermes and Aphrodite, obviously the beautiful Aphrodite uh, goddess. And that's where we get the term hermaphrodite. Um, the idea of a person with, um, you know, the, the both male and female sexual parts. Um, and, I mean, this is something that is now going to need to be explored in detail because I think that this is the beginning of opening or finding a key to unlocking a much deeper level of activity with Tash Tepala. So, um, uh, yes, exactly. Yep. It's a deeper cosmogony. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Right. Well, there he is. All right. Okay. Now, um, we'll get on to this now. Here's the story. Uh, when we were in Turkey last year, uh, with Hugh JJ, um, uh, we learned about the discovery of a very strange statue, uh, with what appeared to be almost like a bird man head with a uh, very strange, um, almost Viking-like uh, headdress going down the back, you know, hair done as, as dreads in a bun with shaved above the ears uh, and with snakes up the side of it. And we tracked it down to a landowner uh, to the south of Karahan Tepe. Um, and um, the owner, the landowner, showed me some caves at the time but we were able to go back this time. And what we've discovered is that the statue has now been taken to Shanlerfa Museum and that the archaeologists are now incredibly interested in this site. It's on a hill and there are a series of caves all the way around it. Some of them with very obvious carvings on um, this one here. You can see twin snakes. Um, directly above one of the entrances and um, I mean the archaeologists are probably going to look at these caves and say they're probably just a couple of thousand years old you know maybe date to Roman times there was a little castle on the top of the um, of the the hill however we are coming to the conclusion that there is a strong possibility that these could be from the age of Tash Tepala, and that they may even have represented the dwellings of individuals, maybe even important individuals that were associated with there. And the interiors of these, um, these caves are very, very peculiar. Um, I mean, you haven't just got support columns inside them or niches or windows or whatever, but you have these very strange U-shaped columns with like flat surfaces, um, you know, between them. Now, at first you might think, well, is this some kind of altar or something like that? But no, the landowner, who is one of the only people that has been into these, um, these caves and clearly has been going into them probably since he was a child, believes that they're perches, 
that they were places where the individuals would actually literally perch, you know, sort of crouch on on two legs. And there are a number of these perches uh, inside these caves. And we think these are very, very ancient. And what's also interesting is that the landowner pointed out, this is um, Nick Burton there pointing out, that there are twin marks on the ground that have actually been heavily uh, incised or etched into them that represent that the perches. And he actually stood, you know, with his two feet in these perches and showed how this was done. And, you know, there, there's there's enough here along with the actual um, statue itself to start suggesting that this could be a very, very important site. Now, we're obviously not saying where it is because, you know, the landowner has asked us not to reveal that. And this is what happens with a number of these um, these these places mm. that we're being shown because, you know, we're outside of the, the system. We're there just to preserve the culture and to try and understand, you know, what was going on at these places in the past. So the, the local people do tend to open up to us in a way which they might not do to certain other people. Um, so they're telling us about these. And it's a very interesting. Now, Deb, do you want to say anything about these these caves at all? Just that, obviously, you know, just to reiterate what you said there, that the idea of perches is, is interesting. So even if they're not Tash Tepla, why would there be perches? Why would humans, from whatever time, Bronze Age, Iron Age, who cares what age, why would humans of any time want to sit in a perch-like manner, want to exist in a cave or live in a dwelling or use a cave or a dwelling like this, a hypogeum, in a perch-like fashion? Why would they want to do that unless they're actually living in in the style of a bird or living in the way that a bird would do and um because of its location um it's possibly connected to vulture shamanism and that the the shamans that actually lived like birds and like vultures so shamans tend to <clears throat> you know when they take on the, the 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 spirit of an animal and they become its avatar sort of half live that life that an animal would live and its instincts and its mannerisms and its movements and its instincts and half of a human. So it, it begs the question, you know, what were they living here? Were these bird shames, these vulture shames living here in in as kind of like almost like vultures? Uh, and I mean, you know, some of them are very well made. And I'm not saying that all of these are Tash Tepler at all. I mean, it's probably yeah. that they were further carved out maybe a couple of thousand years ago i mean you can't help but start thinking about the underground cities at cappadocia with these i mean what do you think you i think these are really interesting so uh, uh, we all me and jj almost walked up to one of these with you last time but we were kind of obsessed by the statue i think and uh we scanned it and everything thankfully i'm glad we did now um but yeah, I mean, what so are you suggesting? These are kind of um, living quarters. Do you think these are connected with the nearby sites? Because we know there's another site nearby here as well. Yeah. I don't want to mention it. Um, and um, but is there is there any natural water sources in this area that you're aware of directly here? Uh, yeah, I think there are. Yeah, I, I think that was one of the reasons why the settlement was actually there. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I mean the. The, the owner very clearly believes that, um, and who isn't amongst that group there, I mean, that, that's our posse that uh, went there. There's so Richard Wald, Nick Burton, Deb and mm -hmm. Rene Goulet at the, uh, at the back there. Mm -hmm. um, and when we were here, the, the landowner believed, well, no, not believed, but, 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 but told us that these were the places of the djinn. Um, you know, these are like um, evil spirits, if you like, that can manifest into human form, often out of smoke, often out of fire, that is believed in Arabic and Turkish tradition. Um, and they have incredible firm belief in this. I mean, the landowner was 100 percent convinced that, that these were the dwelling places of jinn. And to end all of this, I think that we it's only right and fitting to tell you what actually happened when we came away from this site. 
um, because as we came away, and it was weird because we were enjoying the hospitality of, of the landowner and the weather changed dramatically. I mean, suddenly there was fierce winds. It started spitting with rain. And it was quite clear that there was a shift in the atmosphere. Um, it was after sunset. We felt this is it. It's time that, you know, we left. So we basically, you know, got up at that moment, uh, said our goodbyes and uh, went back down the, the path onto the road. And as we did so, we looked back and there was a figure on the top of the hill and it's ringed here. And by the way, these are pictures by uh, Rene herself. Um, I mean, I, I took photos as well, but mine are of very poor quality, but you can still see the figure. Um, and we thought, who the hell is that? Now, we'd been up here, remember, you know, an hour earlier, well, for, for two or three hours. And the only person that had been up there, and bear in mind that, you know, we were there with the landowner, was essentially a lad in Western clothes. I mean, and I think he was probably a neighbour, inquisitive, you know, bit nosy, finding out what was going on. Nobody else was up there whatsoever. And clearly this is land that's owned. So clearly the landowner knows what the hell's going on on his land. And so these pictures were taken. And when we zoomed in on of them, we saw this. Now that's a, a more closer picture, but this is the close up picture. What the hell is that basically? Well, a lot of people's first impressions is it's a, it's a woman in a hijab or burqa. Um, but I just want to make it quite clear that the women in the village and surrounding do not wear them. They wear long-sleeved, long-skirted, colourful patterned dresses and colourful patterned headscarves. They do not wear black hijabs or burqas. So that is not the traditional dress. So that's just to clear that up. Yeah, and also I want to point out that this figure is looking towards us because we, as we were looking at it, and I was taking pictures and Rennie was taking the pictures, it turned around and, and just vanished from sight. And I'm not saying it vanished magically, but it just vanished out of our sight. Um, and, I mean, look, you know, I'm not saying that this is a gin, but we sent copies of the pictures to the landowner and he said, I have no idea who this is. And it said, you've just done my head in, basically. And we said to him, he you said, know, you've could this be a gin? You've ruined my psychology. You've ruined my psychology. Yeah, I mean, well, that was the weird translation, <laughs> obviously, of the translator. I mean, I'm sure that's not what he was saying in Turkish. Um, but, I mean, who knows what this is? But what's so interesting is that he did say and does believe that this is a place of the gin. And that looks the best picture i've ever seen of a gin just look them up so i, I think that's probably it and here's a, a a weird um uh enhancement that our friend john merrin uh did i mean he did a series of them which makes them look makes it look even more spooky so i think with that we won't frighten the life out of our viewers any further um but just to say that uh, my book, uh, Karahan Tepe, uh, is coming out later this year. Um, watch out for that. Obviously, I'll be telling you all about that. Obviously, Hugh, you've got your book um, already out, which is Quebec Tepe and Karahan Tepe, which is a wooden book. And quite clearly, if people want to come along with us to Turkey, either in May, which is clearly next month, or in September, um, then all the details are on megalithomania.co.uk or on andrewcollins.com um, and we'll continue the quest with you. So mm -hmm. I think that's it. I mean, any last final thoughts from anybody? Um, no, just to say that um, for anybody who might be interested, I'm talking about shamanism and animism and Tash Tepler again at the Stone Seekers Conference on the 6th of October um so you can look that up online and, and find a link to that if you want to know more about um this unique animistic perspective on tash tepler fantastic i mean yeah i'm i'm, I'm gonna be there too debbie so I'll, I'll see you there um but yeah that that was that was very interesting you seemed i can't believe you saw a gin at the end of your journey this is just 
something else. It's something yeah. I mean, me, myself, and JJ and Adora, we we watch loads of videos on YouTube. Our favorite YouTube channels are Nuke's Top Five, and he, he's he's you know, a lot of them are from the Middle East, and they're claiming they're jinns in the shadow figures moving about and hooded figures. So the fact you've got one at a place said to be the home of the jinn is just mind blowing. And it makes yeah. you wonder, it makes you wonder about the kind of the magic at these sites, you know, you know, and what, one of the sort of darker ideas about why they covered these sites up and buried them and have destroyed some of them. I mean, even now, if a man's broken in three or four parts, you know, they wanted to kind of break the magic and like cover it up. Maybe there was like mm -hmm. a gin infestation or something like this back in prehistoric mm -hmm. times. But yeah, no, this it was absolutely compelling. Thank you for joining us. And I, I'm glad the trip was a success. It seemed like you just broke through a lot of things that needed to be done. Yeah. Um, and coming in from the perspective of the the shamanic perspective and the sacred perspective, I think is, is yeah. super important because it just to, it's like to me and to those us people we we love the mythology, we love the kind of magic of these sites, and we we, are, we have an understanding, you know, deep understanding of all this, all the prehistory mm -hmm. of it, and all the research has been done, and it's just frustrating that so many of the archaeologists and the, the academics are trying to make them sort of secular, they're trying to make them mundane sites, uh, sites, not not temples anymore, going against what Klaus Schmidt said. So we're coming back to this point we brought up at the beginning, and I think. Um, um, you know, there's so much symbolism here. I mean, this is what JJ specialized in and the animistic and the shamanic aspects and the cosmological, the astronomy and everything else. And even the geometry and the metrology and other things like this, it just shows you that there was something remarkable going on back then. And to be at that time when we're witnessing this unfold and come out the ground, it's like going back to, you know, the 1600s in Mexico when they're, you know, discovering the pyramids or Machu Picchu in South America or the pyramids of Egypt and they're yeah. finding all these things under the sand. This is happening now. And we're, we're at the, yeah. we're, we're there to witness it. So it's just this, you know, it feels like an honor to be alive at this time to experience this. And well, thank you both so much. I'm delighted you came on, you know, joined. The megalithomania youtube uh, channel to kind of discuss all this obviously um we have the tours we have the big conference in may as well we have the origins conference later in the year and, and peter knight's conference as you said the stone seeker event in october the 6th and there's much more going on so thank you guys and thanks everyone for listening you can check out all our details at the links below all the links to the tours and myself andrews and debbie's research and, and a couple of links to articles and everything else so thank you guys thanks megalithomaniacs and we'll see you next time